call is now being recorded. Hi, welcome to V2V Podcast. This is Shorts, and today uh, uh, we are going to be talking to Bernadette Doyle, who is a survivor of TTI. Hi, Bernadette. Hi. Um, I'm going to say that uh, we have kind of a, a screw up with the recording, so I'm sorry that, um, but I'm going to I'm going to ask Bernadette to start over again, but. Basically, um, her story is quite incredible, um, and so it's one you should listen to. Um, it's about TTI, and I'm not going to ask you to answer that again, but please start over again. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's totally okay. Um, I think maybe this time I'll go a bit more in-depth about uh, why it was so terrible at my parents did what they did. Yeah, but, yeah you should. Um, you should. And, and also, you know, Please let me know, like, how did you actually get to the program? You know, particularly because it's like in the yeah. wilderness, right? So, like, what's that like when you like walk up into that and like, you know? So, anyway, she she went to wilderness. So we're gonna start and and try to do this this way. And uh, go ahead. Well, um, so my parents were not great to me growing up. Um, my mom is a severe narcissist. She also has borderline. We think possibly any social too, but she fires therapists anytime she gets diagnosed with something. Um, And they didn't treat me really good. They, you know, they'd hit me and stuff. My mom would like strangle me, lock me in little closets. They had a room in the basement that they would keep me in for crying and stuff. They would restrict what I eated. Um, like, it, they just had total control over me. And my dad wasn't around a whole lot. My parents got divorced when I was in middle school. Okay. Um, and once they split, it was kind of just me and my mom. And if I went to my dad's, he would just absolutely hit me. Um, yeah. So... I eventually ended up developing an eating disorder because I thought if I looked really sick, then somebody had to help me. Somebody had to say, I'm sorry this is happening. Like, I care about you. I want to make this better. Um, But instead, after I refused to go to school for, I think, six months, um, I kind of, my parents woke me up. They told me I had to go to a special therapy appointment. And they were in the room together, which freaked me out initially because they hate each other and they'd never be caught dead in a room together. Right. Um, So I started, you know, I started telling them, like, I'm okay, I'm fine, I gained weight, look, and I, I pulled out a scale and it uh, pulled me up as being, like, you know, 105 pounds, just 10 pounds lighter than the last time they checked on me. And I'm pretty big, so that was, you know, six feet tall, 100 pounds. It's not healthy. It's bad. Yeah. And my doctors yeah. were telling me that I was, you know, I didn't – I might – that I could die, that I didn't have a lot of time left. So – they started telling me that I was going to go to this program for eight weeks. I go to summer camp and there'd be, you know, activities and stuff like that. And it was therapy and I'd get better. And I told them like, absolutely not. I can't do that. You can't make me go away. And I um, threatened to hurt myself. So they ended up putting me in the hospital for a few days. And when I got out, um, my dad, and my uh well my dad picked me up and then my they had to pick up an aunt because they said I was too unstable to uh <laughs> go by myself with just my dad. Um Okay. So they took me and my aunt and my dad up to Vermont and they signed me in and they got me fitted in all my stuff, they got my pack together and they kinda just drove me in this van for a while and dropped me off at this I thought it was like Hooverville. I mean, it was just a bunch of tarps. And God. they dropped me off and they just said, like, this is where you're going to be at. And they put the pack on my back and I fell over. It collapsed on me because the pack <sighs> weighed 
almost as much as I did, and I was very physically weak at that point. I had osteoporosis and all that. Sure. Um, and, you know, we got to hiking the first day, and I physically could not walk what they were telling me to do, and I was scared. I felt really humiliated by what, you know, they were yelling at me, and they were telling me, just do it, just be stronger, and I, you know, there's a limit so, to how much mental strength you can gain. Sure. Can I ask what this program was called? True North Wilderness Program. Okay. It's um, and, in Waitsfield. Okay. And so every time that you you sort of couldn't do it and, and it was too much for you and you were probably having multiple panic attacks and probably, like, <laughs> just freaking the fuck out. Um, yes. Did... Did everyone that was walking with you have to stop too? Was that kind of part of it? Because yes, I've kind of did. seen right. So therefore, it kind of becomes a thing where everyone hates you because you're having a panic attack. That was because a large it, problem that we had. Right. I because I kind of like I kind of get the idea of what wilderness would have been like, and I kind of get the idea that that's probably part of the whole thing, right? And and and. Your participation for not listening. Yeah, and and then ostracizing you with your peers as well for not listening because you're now holding everyone else up and everyone just wants to get to camp, right? Because you yeah. have to like you have if to you hike a certain camp, amount. You can't sleep. You can't eat. Right. Okay. 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 So <laughs> you have to like. Are you given like a certain amount that you have to hike per day? As a they group? Tell, well, they kind of tell you in the morning. They give you an estimate, but there's someone that's in control. One of the peers is in control of the maps, and they really know how long it is. And it would usually be half a mile was an easy one. Two miles was a bad one. That doesn't sound like a lot. You know, I live in the city. I walk probably more than that every day. Sure. However, with 80 pounds, 90 pounds on your back, if you're carrying all the trash cans and stuff. Um, sure. That's a long hike, especially yeah. there weren't any trails where we were hiking, and it was in the middle of the woods, so it was kind of just like bushwhacking for two miles, right. with heavy packs, and I couldn't probably even do that without the pack, without the bushwhacking. Um, and and how, long, how long would it generally take you to achieve this as a group? Because clearly you were having to do it as a group. A... Usually, it took more. I mean, four hours was a really spectacular day. Uh, the longest we ever okay. did was twelve. Okay. So, what are you sort of doing in the other times of the day, and and what's going on during all that? It's hiking, eating, sleeping. You get to camp, and you have to dig a latrine. Um, right. And that's. You know, you set up, you put the big tarps up, you put the little tarps up, and you find some good spots for everybody, and you get the trash can lit out and start making dinner and all that. Um, but that's it. that was it. I mean, there wasn't really any free time unless it was a day, like the one day a week we weren't hiking, and that was just right. the food dropped off. Right. And and what kind of staff are sort of, like, with you at this time, and, and like, what levels of sort of, um, mental health training or even sort of therapeutic training do any of these staff have? I was just about to say that. They did not... Um, I could be recalling this wrong, but most of them were fresh college grads. Um, they did not have... I think they looked more for outdoorsy people than they looked for people that actually had training as therapists. Um, a lot of them were in their early mid 20s so they absolutely could not have been you know therapists yeah a lot of them yeah. had some training in social work but they weren't therapists they I, right you know they offered us support but they didn't really offer us any therapeutic techniques beyond working the program right and and so like what <laughs> sorry i look 
I, it blows my mind, but um, like, what what is exactly the goal that you have to achieve to get the hell out of this fucking thing? And and tell me how you got out of this and how long you were there, also. Um. Well, my my personal visit was um cut short because after about forty days, they told me that I was going to be going to a boarding school, and I was thinking like. I worked my ass off. I, you know, shed my inauthentic self. I did what you asked. Why am I not going home? That's all I want. Right. right. And so actually this girl kind of just came up to me one day and she said, do you want to run away? And I said, yeah, let's get out of here. They're doing the same thing to her. And we ended up in the middle of the night. They didn't give us any shoes, so we put on all our socks. Yeah. Um, and we walked and we calculated by the drive time and the amount of songs that were played in the car that we were about 15 miles into the woods. So we walked that, we walked out, we got to this little town and we hitchhiked to Boston. We were, you know, by the time the guides were awake that morning, we were already stealing frappuccinos from Stop and Shop. Um, oh, how epic. How epic that must have been. It, I mean, for us, we thought, hey, this is good because they can't sniff us out. They don't know where we are. That we're so we're sure. 200 miles away. They don't know where we are. They'll never sure. find us. Um, yeah. We spent the day, you know, shoplifting, getting clothes because we smelled, trying to find somewhere to shower, to shave, look presentable so we could beg and stuff like that. Yeah. Um. And I ended up calling, well, I picked, I was, she ditched, she ended up ditching me outside of Pinkberry because we'd been fighting a lot that day and I'd been kind of rude to her. And okay. I thought to call my mom, but immediately knew that was a bad idea. So I called my dad and I told him, like, I'm, you know, I'm okay. I want you to know I'm doing just fine, but I'm not going back to that program. I'm not coming home. Like, I'm not telling you where I am. And then. He started asking me, like, oh, well, how's your day going? What is it like there? And I was so confused because I didn't even realize and I was off my meds. I had no idea that he was trying to get the police to locate me, and they did. And I spent the night in jail, and my parents hired um, transporters, or as we call them, goons, um, which is right. basically kidnappers for hire. Yeah. Um, they hired them to drive me back to the program, and the program, you know, told me, no, you can't come back. Mm. (laughs) So they sent me to some little other program where I was awaiting further placement. That program, you know, they wouldn't let me call my parents because they thought I had a tone. Um, Right. they, They called me fat. They wouldn't let me visit my dad because he was, he gave me ice cream. Um... It was, what was this program called? It was called NFI. It's in Vermont, um, and I was only there for about a week and a half before my parents uh, worked with an educational consultant to find uh, yeah, a yeah, I, residential program. Of course, yes. Yeah. Um, so I was afraid. They just kind of woke me up one morning, and they said, hey, would you like to go to North Carolina? And I said, no. And they said, well, great, you're going. And they took my dad and my uh, uncle to drive me down to North Carolina because they thought I might run again. Yeah. And I got there, and that was kind of where I started thinking, this is my life now. What What was this program called? Solstice East. Um, okay. I was there for 11 months. Okay. Um, and I convinced myself I wasn't, you know, I thought I was one of the good kids and I'd be getting out soon. And they kind of fed that idea in me by letting me move up through the initial phases really fast and making me think. So what, was, what, what are phases? Up? What so are phases? phases are kind yeah. of like these. Um, they're like markers of your progress in a way. So you kind of get okay. them, the most, I I think like a lot of it comes down to stitching in a way. Like, you know, 
telling on so your peers. They call it accountability. Is is this to sort of earn, as you sort of, okay, so you get in, you're like on one phase or you're on phase one or something, right? And Yeah. And so you probably have a lot less privilege than someone who's on phase, say, five or we did it by the hero's journey, which to me was corny. So when I got on separation <laughs> phase, what um, is the hero's journey? Uh, Sorry, something they model like hero movies after. So it's okay, like the journey the hero goes through. Um, Can you tell it, me th- about <laughs> this? Because I like quackery. Because I I think it's good to expose quackery when there's quackery. Um, well, they they gave us, it was a cycle, right? So the hero starts out his journey lost and confused. He needs an orientation. And, of course, orientation <laughs> means that you're on arm's length with the staff and you can't talk to anybody. Um, okay. So once you get past that, there's, like, the separation. So you're starting to separate from the real world and immerse in your journey. And then you get to the threshold, which means you're really starting to get in there. And the initiation, which means your journey has truly begun, the transformation, which means you've started to change and become one with the journey, and then there's the atonement, where you've really changed, but you're not ready to go back, and then there's the return. Um, From what I've heard, they added a bunch of pokey phases after I left to kind of keep people there longer, because people started doing crazy stuff on return phase. Mm. Um. But that was basically it, and, you know, I... Generally, generally with... Sorry, just to interrupt. Generally, when they do that, or programs start to do that, when they add to keep kids, that's generally because they're having problems getting kids in, which is actually a good sign. But, I mean, just to let you know, like, from what I what I, what I gather from, from TTI, it seems um, like... I wouldn't doubt that they had a good business model going. Um, actually, my family is, I believe my dad is still about $200,000 in debt um, right. to that program because okay. he, you know, it's $12,000 a month. He couldn't pay that. Um, well, right. it's that and other programs, but that one, you know, he still, I think he so- only paid off like a, 20th of them or something. So the education specialist that, by the way, I I commonly refer to education specialists as the pimps of TTI because that's what they are. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, they didn't figure out a way for your school system to pay for these programs. They yeah. sort of schlepped it onto your parents. Okay, cool. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Um, I met my head consultant once. And that was during my atonement phase when I was about to leave. Okay. And to get to atonement, you have to snitch out others? Is that what you were saying? Well, that's not all of it. That was just the accountability thing where you critique your peers, you um, yeah. hold them accountable, so you stop them from doing bad things, you tell on them when they do bad things, and then there was the whole thing of, like, doing it with yourself. Um, yeah. You know, to kind of almost Usual. feed into the us versus them type thing. Usual brainwashing, um, behavioral modification bullshit kind of stuff. Yeah. You know. And at yeah. first, I was good at it because I, you know, I was like, I just ran away. Like, these people, you know, I'm smarter than them. I can make it, like... I'll do it, and, you know, I, I singled out the people I didn't like, which, who didn't? You don't want to snitch on yeah. your real friends. So, you know, right. if somebody was sneaking, you know, candy or they had a CD they weren't supposed to have, you know, we'd kind of rat them out a little bit. Um, yeah. Most of the time that was considered, like, you know, that sort of little thing was crappy, but if someone was, like, hiding something or they were like depressed and lying about it or they were self-harming and lying about it we would tell on them so basically you kind of became like staff almost or you were almost doing the job of staff or keeping everything just 
Yeah, it's, it's just madness that because it creates such problems within peer to peer sort of relations and, and you have to live together. You're forced yeah, to live and if together. We, if we got too close with our peers, there were, uh, methods of, they would basically sit us away for, if we, you know, we had like codependency yeah. issues or were talking too much or whatever, they would sit us away from the group. Yeah. If it was just one person, they'd make you sit 10 feet away and they'd have to have a staff monitor you so you weren't talking to them. You could get in trouble right. for even looking at somebody in a social way. Right. Um, yeah, I, word, I'm quite quite familiar with this method, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, you already did an interview with JC. She was at that program as well, but um, yeah. they had this thing called safety phase um which was safety? probably safety phase okay so safety okay it wasn't a regular phase you got put on it if you were in trouble and basically when i initially got there what that entailed was that they'd toss you in the basement with two staff you know windowless basement and they'd bring you your meals and they'd make you fill out a bunch of paperwork uh, yeah. Not not real paperwork, but like therapy work to kind of atone for what you did. What can and you can you kind of like go into detail about what kind of stuff they made you fill out in those papers? Or you had to like I actually I have some uh, fun cool samples because I saved them. Ooh. Because um, I thought they were funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, so basically, what I I only got put on safety phase once, but I didn't get basement safety. Thank God, because I I probably would have lost my mind. But me and my friend sure. had this redneck teacher, and he said something during class that we thought was funny. He was like, if you think that's how the government works, you can smash before ways on Sunday. And we were, like, just talking about it over lunch, like, how many ways are there to smash? Like, does that even make any sense? And then right. the staff heard us, and we both got put on safety. So I have – I don't know if this is all of it, but I've got – what's this? So this is – a letter to my friend. Huh. Here's the paperwork. It's so, so cool that you saved all this, by the way. I have the handbook. Actually, I'll go get the handbook because that's probably the best part. Um, so the paperwork <laughs> I had to fill out was mentalizing in relationships. So, what okay. are my intentions? And I said, to be funny and have a good laugh with my friend. They said, what are the intentions of your friend? I said, to have fun and laugh with me. And what are the intentions of the teacher, the person I hurt, um, to teach his class and use metaphors? Okay. How do my intentions affect my friend and the teacher? I could be encouraging my friend by not taking the topic seriously and shutting it down like I should have. I may have... My interpretation of the teacher's comment may make him uncomfortable. How do the intentions of my friend and others affect me? It can be encouraging to hear my peers saying something funny. I like to have as much fun as them. So I may struggle to do what I know is right. So let's say you're, you're, you're like probably like 20 minutes in now. And you've been in this sort of like basement area already, and you're 20 minutes into writing at this point, probably, right? No, no, no. I I got put in the basement like five months into my stay. I wasn't in the basement even. They had me sleep on a mattress in the hallway, and I wasn't allowed to go to school, but that was it. No, but I mean, like, while you're writing this in the basement, you're probably like 20 minutes into being in the basement, right? What, where you're at they, reading to me. It takes a few hours to process, but yeah, they give that to you and they make you basically just work on that for a few days and the way yeah. they finish it off is they have a council of your peers vote to whether you have to appeal to them and they vote whether it's okay to take you off or not. Oh, for and fuck's sake. Oh. <laughs> My favorite. Um, so I, I liked being on them because I'd always vote yes even if the person was like not doing well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but my peers were upset at me because they thought I was lying about my trauma and they thought that I just wanted attention or something. So they all voted no. And that meant that my punishment had to resume. Um, there wasn't any legitimate reason. I, I did fill out the paperwork and everything. And my therapist even said that it was a load of shit and she took me off eventually after I appealed to her. But 
but so you've done this paperwork. So you're just basically sitting in this room for All this day time. I'm talking. Okay, this is really therapeutic, yeah. I mean, and actually, to be honest with you, this place sounds almost identical to the place I went to. It sounds well, really close to it. Yeah, but, but. They're, they're, they differ a lot with different things, but this, this in particular, this part, because it, it just, sorry, I, I don't want to like get into my story because I want this to be about yours, but, um, this is very familiar. Yeah, no, I understand. A lot of them do do stuff like this. Um, yeah. I, was, I considered myself lucky because I wasn't in the basement room. I did – actually, when I first got there, there was a girl who just, like, jetted off to the pharmacy and stole codeine syrup while she was um, supposed to be at the gym. And yeah. And she was in the basement for three months. Okay. Um, no peer contact. Yeah. Nothing. Just paperwork, paperwork, paperwork. They wouldn't even let her have a peer appeal for, I think, like a month or two months. Um, and actually what ended up happening was that, you know, it's not really any of my business to tell this, but it does kind of feed into something traumatic that happened where that um, her father had passed away and she was put on suicide watch and she... um. You know, they weren't listening to her. They wouldn't let her go home for, um, you know, to see her family. So she yeah. uh, jumped off her balcony. She was in the hospital right. for months, and we did not hear from her. She's the one that JC talked about jumping off the balcony because JC was watching her because JC was must too. have been okay. <laughs> oh, okay. actually, more than a few people saw that. Okay. <laughs> And, you know, yeah, around dinner time when you're all hanging out. For sure. Um, and actually, just after JC left, one of the students passed away um, on a home visit. She got in a car accident at Christmas, <sighs> and they didn't tell us for a week. We were all wondering, like, where is she? What happened to her? Like, yeah. why haven't we heard from her? She was supposed to come home days ago, and they kind of just, wouldn't answer, and then they rounded us all up one day and said she's she's dead. Could I could I ask you a favor? Um, could you give me like a, a a regular day there? Say you're sort of like midway through, like I don't know what that is like on, on the hero levels, but say you're like a level three or something in in the in the process. Um, give me an average day there. You wake up at what time? You do what? You do this? You do that all the way through the let day, if possible. I have the handbook here. So let me see if okay. I have that specifically in here. Um, a lot of stuff about the phases. A lot of stuff about the phases. Codes of conduct. Laundry. Hygiene. Safety phase. Um, so basically, we woke up at seven, okay. and we would eat breakfast. We'd have like an hour to kind of get ready, and then we'd eat breakfast, and then we'd have study hall, and then we'd have our first group of the day, and um, that you know is usually DBT something or another. And then we, some, you know, once a week we'd have individual therapy, and then sometimes we get pulled out for that, which is a godsend because the groups were so monotonous. Yeah. Then we'd have lunch, and then we'd go to school for uh, three, four hours, not very long. And then we'd do gym, um, and then we'd do dinner. Okay. And I think there's another group in there somewhere, and then we'd go to sleep. And what We'd time would you? Peer groups a lot. We were in bed usually by eight. Okay. Yeah, that sounds about right. Early to bed. Early I mean, not right, not not right at all. But yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to see if there's anything else in here. Did you place. Did you clean? Oh did yeah, you we guys did have cleaning. Right. Okay. Yeah. Typical. So actually, I could read maybe some of the requirements to get on a student yeah. phase. 
Um, just got this now. So uh, trans phase is kind of the big phase everyone wanted to be on. Okay. Um, number one, complete one personal quest designed by you and your therapist. Okay. And it said something talk to crossed out with my therapist, write about the potential positives of crossed out. Okay. Um, review your long and short-term goals that you established during your previous phase. Discuss your progress with your guide and update your goals to reflect on the next steps you need to take in your journey. Number three, with your guide, choose two principles from your hero's code. Oh, that was a little thing. We had a book of principles at the front of our book. Um, okay. That you will actively learn about while you are on this phase. Together, you will choose or create a quest related to each principle that you will create. Complete. Complete all assignments extended by your guide. Display initiative and engagement in all interactions with your guide. Work with your guide to create a service project based on a principle from your hero's code that you will complete for your home community during atonement phase. Provide a proposal of this service project to the treatment team. Complete three therapeutic assignments assigned by your therapist. God, this is a long one. It's a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's the like and things that were like display personal responsibility and good work ethic and stuff like that. Um, it's just it's just endless monotony. Service. It's just yeah. monotony. It's and it's just, it's just to drive you nuts, really, because really for you're a teenager and you've been sent to this place against your will. I was 14 when all this was happening. Right. <laughs> right. Right. I hadn't even finished That's the ninth grade. So fucked up on so many levels. Um, but I was, um, I think probably the worst thing that happened, I, Solstice is not my worst program, but, um, okay. <laughs> Uh, the po- program after Solstice is the worst, but I think the biggest thing we'll at Solstice was that um, there was an incident where they took a few of us girls to Mexico, and this girl who was kind of the queen bee um, told everyone that the girls on our team that went to Mexico were talking crap about her. So when we got back, it was actually my birthday, and everyone would not talk to me. This girl called me a cunt, and, like, people were screaming at me. I did not know what the fuck was going on. And the one right. person in the building who would still talk to me, we went in the basement to watch King of the Hill and cry together. Um, that was my 15th birthday, my quinceanera. And um, and then I was ended up being ostracized. My other peers basically said, oh, it was all my idea. So they all got let back into the group, and it was just me. They made me sit. Even the staff encouraged me sitting separate at lunch, and they would hold groups about me um, to tell me that I just needed to confess. And I I still didn't know what they were talking about. They said I laughed at her while she was having a manic episode. And I think I had laughed at her one time because – she was scaring me because she used to dress in yellow face a lot. And she was making me really yeah. uncomfortable. Um, and I was like, uh, <laughs> what the fuck is this? Like, what's going right. on? Um, and that was all it took. And for about two months, you know, I wa- I begged to be transferred to another program. I I wanted to go to Utah. I didn't care. Like, I just wanted to go somewhere else because people were – confronting me in the hallways and telling me that I wasn't doing what I needed to suppo- like be supposed to do and I was making fun of people and I was a bully and right. I, I gossip, I, I talk, but like I certain I wasn't saying much worse than anybody else was. Yeah. Um so that was actually a horrifying experience for me. The staff well, wouldn't move me up. Like- Most of the staff wouldn't even talk to me. It sounds like complete gaslighting. It sounds like you go to Mexico and then all of a sudden you're gaslit for two months. You're just like, everyone's not talking to you and everyone's just yelling at you and it's about nothing. And and you can't figure it out. Even if I had laughed at her for acting goofy during a manic episode, I don't think it justifies being ostracized for three months. Yeah, and and so what? 
Yeah. Um, That's the other part. So, but, yeah. So you get out of this program, and then you go to a horrible, horrible program, which was called what? Oliverian. Um, okay. Boarding school. And where? New Hampshire. So basically what Solstice ended up doing was um, I had leftover Ativan prescription, and I'd been learning a lot about drugs while I was in Solstice. So they sent me home with my leftover Ativan in a little baggie. It was just tucked in my stuff, and I kind of thought to myself, hey, you know, I'm one of the bad kids now, so mm. I should mess with it. And I smoked it, and I never – fucking felt better in my life I'll be yeah. honest that was the, yeah. I was so high and I yeah. it overcame me I was 15 I didn't know what it was um, and then I only had a month between solstice and my boarding school but you know I would smoke I got I ended up forcing a doctor to give me a prescription I would smoke it out of light bulbs in public I would roll my cigarettes in it um Wow. It, I, I became a full drug addict in that month, and mm. it made me feel mm. so much better about what had happened. Of course, yeah. So then I got to Oliverian, and, you know, I tossed all my contraband in the river before I got there, all my cigarettes and all my pills. And, well, not all my pills, but, you know, the less valuable ones, because I'd been abusing, like, pseudoepinephrine or something stupid that 15-year-olds abuse. Yeah. And I got there. And I realized that everybody there smoked cigarettes and that I was stupid to throw mine in the lake. Oh, shit. And I was dumb to throw mine in the lake and all that. Mm. Um, and it, you know, I would abuse my meds. And then other people started saying, hey, you have benzos. Like, I want some, too. So I would package them up in these little... I would decorate them, these little packets, and we would, you know, go get high in the woods, or I'd give them to people. And then I started hooking up with, you know, guys, because this kid one day, I remember I was just about to go to bed, I was high, and this kid came out of her dorm, and she was like, oh, like, you have a visitor. I'm like, what? Why, Why do I have someone visiting me? And this kid just was like, let's hook up. And I did. And, you okay. know, I kind of lost my mind after that. Um, I, you know, the next week this kid came and he told me he had cocaine and he would give me a gram for like five cigarettes or something. And I, you know, I hadn't done cocaine before, but I was like, that sounds like a good enough deal that I shouldn't pass it up. So, so I ended up is this, cocaine. Is this a residential treatment program or is this? Where are you now? You're in a boarding school now, right? Or It's a therapeutic boarding school. But it sounds pretty lax if people are just sort of, like, smoking and, like, you know, passing drugs and stuff like that and having sex. Um, it wasn't supposed to be, but it was. Mm. They were supposed to be keeping an eye on us and drug testing us and all that, but they really weren't. And were they um, doing sort of a level system at this place, or...? It was more just like, can you go home or can't you? Okay. <laughs> so it was a little different, but there were, um, I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more. There were some yeah. serious violations of rights and sex abuse, domestic violence were sweeped under the rug because they thought girls were slutty. Okay. Um, there was a kid, so once a week our English teacher, God bless him, would let us over to his house because he lived on campus, and we would bake cookies. It was innocent, but it was also kind of like the drama meetup for the week. Remember yeah. one day I was talking to my friend, and this kid just sat down next to me and started punching me in the leg. And I was like, what are you doing? That hurts. Stop it. And then I started crying, and he was like, just wanted to see if that would happen. Um. And every week he kept doing that, and I had a giant bruise on my leg, and it kept getting worse. Every week he would okay. hit me more. <laughs> and huh. we weren't dating, so I thought it was fine. I thought we were just playing. And then one day, um, the night before Thanksgiving break, he pinned me down with his friend in the English teacher's kitchen and started <laughs> kicking me in my vagina, 
stomping on me, um, just beating the shit out of me. And okay. I was freaking out and screaming, like, get off me. What? Are you, why are you fucking doing this? What's wrong with you? And then eventually a teacher was like, yo, like, get off her. That's not okay. Um, and then he ended up, you know, talking me into having sex with him. Um, and at first I thought, you know, he's a cool kid, so I'm just doing what's cool. But looking back at it, I was scared. I was yeah, nervous that it would continue if I didn't do it. Yeah. Um, one second. Sure. But, so I ended up doing that, which was technically statutory rape because I was 15. Yeah. And I went home for Thanksgiving break, and, the, you know, my mom, who did not give a shit about me, even, was checking. I was wearing pajama shorts, and she said, what's on your leg? And I said, nothing. I just fell. And then oldest excuse in the book. And then she said, I don't think so. So she went through my phone and found the messages where we talked about it, and she said, oh, this boy was beating you. He was, like, he assaulted you. Like, I'm calling the school. And she did. She did report yeah. to the school. Good. Um, it's not like they didn't know, but they chose not to do anything. It sounds like this. That I must it have just wanted. sounds like they were making a ton of money letting kids sort of do anything they wanted in this place. Seventy thousand dollars a year per kid, fifty kids. Yeah. They Fucking hell. Too. Because they're a nonprofit a school. Right, well, right, right, right. Supposed to be a nonprofit, but I. Okay. You know don't think that sure. everybody was supposed to live on a man like in a mansion on a farm <laughs> did you did, but did you did you have like anyone like mental health there did you have a therapist did you have sort of like we had a counselor but she was not um particularly looking out for my best interest you know what's interesting okay. i was actually just talking to my therapist about this before but i'm bisexual a lot of people are sure. and um, I was hooking up with guys, and they would make me do stuff like clean the vans if I got caught sneaking out, which is fair. I, I get that. Um, but when I had a girlfriend, and I was planning to just go on a date with her, not hook up with her or anything, um, and she wasn't at the school. That's kind of besides the point. It almost makes it less bad because we were on a school trip. Yeah. Um, they took my phone for three months, so I couldn't contact her. Okay. Um. <laughs> Which, to me, kind of sounded like homophobia. That's incredibly homophobic, yeah. It, it it just seemed weird that they penalized me for having a steady girlfriend that I wasn't having sex with versus, like, random boys at the school who were right. a lot older than me, having sex with me and was mm. kind to me, even beating me, that that was not a problem. But right. having a girlfriend right. was. And actually, the boy that was beating me, he had a girlfriend, um, and he, you know, she'd broken off with him because she caught him watching her while she was asleep through her window um, yeah. in the middle of the night, two in the morning, uh, several times. And when she dumped him, he killed a bird um, and started punching staff members and stuff. He... Remain, he actually, I got kicked out. He actually ended up staying for longer than I did. Okay. But I think the worst thing about that school, um, and I'm probably going to cry, so. It's okay. Um, there's this kid that got there. He was, he just, um, turned 14. He was transgender. Um, they made him live in one of the girls' dorms. And, um, <sighs> He was a, such a sweet kid. And there was one day, um, and I did hear this, that a staff member walked in on him trying to slit his throat, um, and she didn't say anything. And three days later, we were just in school, and we start hearing all these radio calls towards the end of the day. I mean, it must have been like 5 p.m. No one would, had seen him since the morning, and they were saying, where is he? Where is he? Like, what happened? Well, it's all public records, so I'm just going to say Alex. Um, but they were like, where's Alex? What's going on? And we had our Wednesday ski trip that day. Um, and um, everyone was kind of freaking out. 
some people were more yeah. nonchalant than others, and everyone's like, where is he? They still haven't found him. It's been, like, 24 hours. It's not good. And I thought I got a Snapchat from him. It wasn't from him. Um, you know, we all had a lot of hope. And then the next day, there were news reporters also all over the campus. There were, like, helicopters oh and stuff like that, um, dogs, cops, you name it. We had a giant pole with a camera going around on top right. of the mountain. And he, um, the school guy told us that there was an important meeting and we all had to congregate after school to talk about it. We were like, what is this about? Probably Alex, but he wouldn't say. And right. then he was supposed to come at like 4 and then 4.15, he's not there. 4.30, he's not there. Like 4.45, he comes in and he looks at all of us stupid little smile and he says Alex was found and we for one second were so happy <laughs> it was like everybody was so relieved you could just feel like <sighs> clouds parting and then he said but he was not alive <laughs> and um, the poor boy committed suicide on our campus he hung himself um he was 14 and they held a little funeral for him and stuff but his parents still want justice I've seen it um it it made me so sick to my stomach how they handled it and they try to act like nothing happened they try to act like they have responsibility there Um, they didn't even look for him for like they he didn't come to school and they didn't look for him because that was just par for the course. Uh, of course, everything went downhill from there. For me, at least, yeah. drugs, prostitution, trying to just fucking cope with it all. Um, and a lot of other students left the school. Everybody's drug problems got worse. People started self-harming more. Um, yeah. Even suicide attempts started growing. People were cutting themselves really deep or taking pills and stuff. Um, it it was it was fucking sick, and I ended up yeah. getting kicked out at the end of the year because I was in um, withdrawal from benzos, which if it, if anybody's not familiar, is the hardest withdrawal to go through, more so than it's heroin. How long are last for months? Yeah. Yeah. Um, day two, I start twitching, shitting myself, all that, vomiting, and I ended up trying to kill myself. I got, I laid down in the middle of the street outside of the therapist's house in my underwear, and I shaved my head. I was a mess, and I called my dad, I remember, and I was screaming. I was like, if you don't tell me you love me, I'll I'll kill myself right now. I'm already laying in the middle of the street. Don't try me, and he hung up, and, um, Eventually, a couple of staff came to restrain me. They tried to put me in the hospital, but they wouldn't because in New Hampshire, if you're under 18, they can't put you in psychiatric hospitals, which right, understandable. Um, and I ended up actually getting asked to leave. Okay. And, um, you know, went home, went into withdrawal. I ended up overdosing a week later. Um, on accident, I seized, I was in the hospital, and then after a month of being home, I decided, you know, so many of my friends are dead, so many of my friends are fucked up, I don't want to live anymore, I can't do this. So I, you know, overdosed, and I was in a coma for a couple of days, and I woke up in a hospital, (laughs) and I got sent to rehab, but that's pretty much my whole treatment story the rehab wasn't anything special right right and then now you're 18 and you're living at home or i live with my dad but i'm moving in with my fiance because he's in college i'm gonna go live with him in a in about a month cool um which is wonderful my life has turned around a lot and i can't really say thanks to treatment because after I left the rehab program, my mom got cancer and the abuse got worse. So I ended up um, turning to heroin, 
cracks, okay. basalt, um, mess, stuff like that. And I'm eight months sober now, but Yay. I've gotten through it mostly with having a good support system. I moved out of my mom, so I don't see her anymore. Yeah. Um, and kind of moving past what happened in treatment, because at the end of the day, I went from a kid that just wanted to be loved and accepted. And by the time, you know, I was 16, I was, I felt so lost that I was yeah. prostituting for drugs and stuff like that. That was fucked up. And as much as people try to put that accountability on you, you're really just trying to survive. Survive. Yeah. Um, and actually what ended up happening was that while I was in rehab, I wanted to finish high school because I skipped a grade and I thought, I'm so close. But what happened was that Solstice and Oliverian, my dad hadn't paid them all the money yet, so they wouldn't transfer my credits. And my public school system said that um, I was going to be a ninth grader again. Mm -hmm. And um, they would not accept me because I had too many problems. Uh, you know, I went to one school and I said, yeah, I'm here for a drug problem. And they said, oh, well, how much pot were you smoking a day? I go, um, I was doing cocaine fairly regularly. I was doing Xanax every single day, eight times a day. Um, yeah. And they said, oh, that's a little bit too much for our program. And you can't go here unless you want to go to our residential program. Mm. I said, absolutely fucking not. And I dropped out of no. high school because it felt like there was, you know, I either be sure. a ninth grader in residential again and play over that hell, or I take matters into my own hands. And I did. And I can't say I feel very bad about it, even though my life is not what I wanted it to be or what I thought it would ever be. Sure. Um, just to let you know, I dropped out too. When I got back, I couldn't, I couldn't complete what they wanted me to complete and I just felt it just wasn't for me and I couldn't sit in a classroom. Most people and can't after the experience no. of treatment. No. I have, a lot of my friends have um, dropped out and at least yeah. even if the ones that finished high school did not make it very far in college. I have do you do one friend from treatment who's in college. Do you do art? Talk to. Um, I'm actually designing a clothing line now because I've always been good with a sewing That's machine. That's awesome. Cool, um, cool. I work retail, which I've discovered I have a good gift for business. Um, cool. <laughs> so I hope That's that goes awesome. somewhere. Me too. Um, listen, I, I also would like to ask you, um... If there's any, like, website you would like me to plug for you or, you know, anything that you would like to say before we go? Um, I think I'm okay. But you okay. did say we were going to talk about some solutions and things yes, like that. Yes, that would be a good idea, too. What do you think would be a better idea for a child in your situation? What do you think is a good idea for teens? I think they draw the age limit a lot at 14. I think yeah. that should be raised to 16 because what, you know, with the wilderness to residential to boarding school, I call it the stream. Um, yeah. That, a lot of times, if you're 14, that's your life. You lose your high school years to that. You lose your childhood in a lot of cases to Absolutely. places you never knew or wanted to be or asked to be or even a lot of the times needed to be. I think it does start with and child, child abuse reform, and they don't allow any accountability of the families. It's all about changing yourself. And I felt a lot of that guilt that I just needed to be better for my mom. I just needed to be better for my family. I think they could really do well within, you know, they think their families are paying, so it's fine. But they need, especially in a situation with mine, like where it was my parents were abusing me should have asked questions about that and they never did yeah yeah i think also that they need to hire better staff members better vetting and people that are 
more equipped to be doing the jobs they're doing because all the therapists I had in treatment were social workers with master's degrees. They're not real therapists at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, I'm sure they might be knowledgeable, and I'm sure some of them are good, but at the end of the day, that's not what the outcome is. Um, And I think that the government needs to step in. I remember um, the government only checked up at Solstice one day a year, and they would make us clean for just fucking days, and they'd coach us on how to talk to the government people and stuff. Um, And That's amazing, though, that they were regulated at all. I mean, my program and most people's programs never are regulated. That's quite – that's something new that I'm hearing. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, does it really count as regulating if they make you no. just tidy the shit out of the place and then tell you, don't tell them about no. anything bad, don't talk about safety things? It, it wasn't regulation. I think those places yeah. actually need someone from the government checking once a week or once a month I, at worst. I think it needs to be an independent body from the government and from the program. I think the body needs to be absolutely independent from the program for sure. You know, it can't have any, it can't have any influence or any sort of like, you know, uh, wine and dining with the program, which seems to happen in every case, you know. I wish there was a way for it to kind of get funding, but not be something politically charged. Yeah. Um, In America, that's not going to happen, but I want to have hope that the government can step in because all I've seen this do, I actually, um, did a study for my psychology class when I tried to go to college for a couple months um, mm. that I did about um, treatment, and I did find that people were in, who were in treatment long-term, and especially people who were in residential and wilderness programs specifically, not rehab, not outpatients, not, you know, right. even boarding school had less bad effects, were half of them experienced something traumatic in treatment. Most of them currently felt suicidal, currently used drugs, had been convicted of a felony. A much larger percentage had dropped out of high school or college than the controls. Um, And even if you can say, well, those were bad seeds to start with, then why did you spend $200,000 fixing? Right. (laughs) It's Mm. just ridiculous to me how much they charge and how little change they make. And a lot of people, I'm sure it really does help them, and a lot of people try to tell me, but this has changed so many people's lives. A lot of that was just teaching people how to get strong through trauma, and that, I guess, there's a small percentage of people that that's a useful tactic for, but that is not a majority by a long shot. No. It's not, and and I'm not going to, like, I'm not going to condone it either, and I'm not going to allow that to even, like, because I feel like these people are still in trauma, and they're still in that constant trauma, and that's what's holding them in that. together after jail, but nobody's going to say the prison system is hunky-dory. Right, Um, exactly. And we were fed. I mean, I've heard of programs where you are not fed, and you are kept in cheeses, but... Um, at the end, you know, in a way, we kind of were. If we acted out or said yeah. a swear word or tried to run, we'd get locked in that fucking basement. Like, that's... Yep. It, it shouldn't it's, be legal. They should no. put things in place about that. And yep. they don't because it's private. It's like church. You can't say and anything I'm, about it. I mean, I feel like also, like, on the, um, on the, like, the home page, there should be pictures of the isolation room with a kid who's currently in the isolation room and what their face yeah. looks like, you know, and what they're they do, doing. You know, because they take pictures of everybody eating dinner on the balcony. Why can't they take pictures of that? That's really yeah. more exactly. representative of a day-to-day life. We weren't even allowed on the balcony. Exactly. <laughs> the pictures well, of you, all look great. <laughs> you know, it, it's remarkable, though, that I'm talking to an 18-year-old for me, as a survivor, uh, who can sort of look back on this and realize exactly what it was and, and kind of get it. Because I know that when I was 18 and after I got out, like, I was pretty fed on the program at that point, And I was pretty, 
programmed. And then a good year or two later, it all started sort of unraveling and falling apart. And I really, I think really... Also, I have been out for a year and a half, and my dad, at least, has talked to me a lot about it, about how, yeah. um, you know, how he didn't even think it was right what was going on. Yeah. And he wanted me not to be there. <laughs> Yeah, that's um, that's helpful. That's really helpful to have parental support and have someone to talk about it with. It's It's been a blessing. I think also I did have a pretty clear-cut case since I was at places where people were committing suicide and sure. getting high and stuff like that and being locked in the basement, which I'm sure some people fed into, but most of us to this day still think safety was fucked up Right. when we talk about it and that it should be not happening. Yeah. Well, listen, um, thank you so much for being on the show. And no problem. Thank you so much for talking TTI, and you have a great night. Um, also, I'd you like too. to, I'd like to say to all of our listeners, um, to click the like and subscribe button, um, and keep our podcast going and spread the word. Um, Thank you very much. This is short. Bye.